So again, my name is Yulia. Uh, actually, we're, we're expected to have a question and answer session at the end, but you, if you feel that your question requires immediate answer right here, right now, then don't hesitate just to interrupt me and ask any question that you want. This topic that we are going to discuss today is very much complicated and it concerns environmental radiation monitoring in Chernobyl exclusion zone. And this is the second activity beside the radioactive waste characterization that we are, uh, that we participate in. Uh, we mean, I mean, central analytical laboratory. We do measurements for environmental radiation monitoring. So the three questions that we are going to answer today are: what to monitor, how to monitor, and what to monitor it at the end of the day. Uh, but before we start, I would love to make a small introduction, just if you don't mind. Do you know what happened on the 26th of April 1986? You don't know what happened? Um, <laughs> so you, basically you do know, everyone in the world I guess knows. There was a, a very big tragedy that changed not only the li lives of a group of people who were evacuated, but also the life of the whole country the Soviet Union, because many scientists and many politicians attribute the breakdown of the Soviet Union to this tragedy. It had a lot of consequences, but one of the consequences was that it actually became a, new, a beginning of the new era for radiation measurements, for reassessment of our view on the nuclear technology, on monitoring, on many things regarding safety. What you see here is actually the ruined uniform, uh, just or maybe several days, maybe several weeks after the disaster. But what about this two? What do you know? What, what do you know about the shelter? What is shelter? The shelter actually is the first sarcophagus that was built, constructed around the ruined reactor in seven months. It was construction was started nearly immediately. What the constructor was actually not very good looking, but it was at least safe and it protected the environment very much from the emissions of the range reactor. And that's why it's called the shelter. What about this one, New Safe Confinement or NSC? Do you know anything about this, this one? So actually this is what the New Safe Confinement looks, today, looks like today. Um, the problem was that these, uh, the engineers and designers of the shelter, uh, they actually uh, guaranteed the operational time for this shelter for only 30 years, and uh, 1996 plus 30 years is 2016. So after 2016, it could have become unstable. That's why Ukraine, with help of many, many other countries, constructed new self-confinement, which they put over this one, so today you will never see this shelter anymore. It looks like that. So it's going to be stable for another hundred years, and um, I hope that we have nothing to worry about until the year 2160. Uh, so just a brief video. I'm going to have four of them, so it's going to take time. A new shelter is being assembled at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine to seal off the site's ruined nuclear reactor. The 20,000 ton new safe confinement replaces the now cracked and unstable sarcophagus erected hastily after the 1986 disaster. The construction site consists of three zones, the object shelter, assembling and waiting areas. Starting with the top, segments of the arch-shaped structure are mounted and transported to the assembling zone. Here they're interconnected, fitted with cladding and hoisted into place on lifting towers. Lower elements are added. Once the first half of the arch is complete, it's moved to the waiting area while the second half is assembled. The two parts are then joined to form a structure measuring 150 meters long, 257 meters wide, larger than the surface area of the Eiffel Tower, and 108 meters tall, higher than the Statue of Liberty. Inside, cables are used to position overhead cranes and high-tech equipment which will be used to dismantle the old sarcophagus and deal with radioactive fuel. Finally, the structure is slid on rails into the object shelter area, isolating the reactor. Costing an estimated 990 million euros, the confinement's due to be in place in 2015 and should last 100 years. So, thank you. We can be sure about this uh, uh, 
shelter for another hundred years, and then we will have the older shelter, older shelter dis dismantled inside of this new one. So, what to monitor then? Uh, here you can see the map of Europe. And um, here you can see the uh, Ukraine actually, it's really the biggest country in Europe. And um, here was the epicenter of the disaster, the, the Chernobyl reactor. And you may see that those re red and pink stains, they represent the contamination which resulted from the accident due to the wind, due the, to precipitation. So you may see that this uh, accident was really transboundary and not only, it was not only Ukraine who suffered from that, but the three major countries were Ukraine, uh, also Belarus, the northern part, uh, the southern part of Belarus, and uh, part of Russia. If we consider Ukraine closer, then you will see that in the north of Ukraine, we have the exclusion zone now, a territory from where the population was evacuated after the accident. Actually, the official name of the exclusion zone is the zone of exclusion and the zone of unconditional mandatory resettlement. In no way it means that it covers all the affected territories, just the most polluted ones, because these territories were also affected. But it covers the territory where the person, the, where the people cannot live, for sure. And I would like to underline one important thing, regardless of what you have seen in the video, that shelter now is more or less safe. That we've covered it with the cockroaches. It doesn't mean that the exclusion zone becomes safe, because the radioactivity that is spread on the territory has never disappeared and will never disappear. We will always have the exclusion zone. We have to tolerate that. We have to accept that. And we have to live with that. And the, probably the best two things that can be done with the exclusion zone are three things. At first is to establish the, all the infrastructure for radioactive waste management here, because it is contaminated. We will not affect public. And there is no public here. Second is conduct research here, and number three is establish a good, harmonious, and powerful system for environmental monitoring. So, there are some brief facts about Chernobyl exclusion zone. Number one, it covers the area of around 2,600 square kilometers. Just to compare, the, it, it's more than the territory of Tokyo, and it's the same territory as, as uh, of the very beautiful mini country in Europe, Luxembourg. A second, it is uninhabited because the population was evacuated. As you know, in 1996, but we still have a question mark about that. We will return to this issue later. It has its own government, state agency on exclusion zone management. Then they are beneficiaries of all the projects that go in the exclusion zone management. They are um, responsible for everything that happens there. And actually, they managed 90% of Ukrainian radioactive waste, as you know from that, uh, the previous presentation. Uh, the territory hosts the largest radioactively dangerous object in the world, new safe confinement. It's still dangerous, of course. And also, it hosts all the radioactive waste management infrastructure. Also, 6,000 personnel live here, no, live, live in shifts. When, when they work here, they leave. They stay for another part. And a place of temporary stay uh, for the personal and administrative center of Chernobyl exclusion zone is the town of Chernobyl. Here is the pie chart representing briefly the types of terrain in Chernobyl exclusion zone. If we look here, then we see that almost half of the territory, or nearly half of the territory, is covered with woods, which means that cold fires happen here very often. And this is a problem, and this is what influences the way how we actually monitor it. Let's go to the question of contamination of Chernobyl exclusion zone. The estimates show that, I put it in Ukrainian here, but it's basically curious, that the amount of radioactivity within the Chernobyl exclusion zone amounts to 432,000 curious. This is the this is without the shelter, just on the territory of Chernobyl exclusion zone. These radioisotopes are present as loose contamination because they are can they can potentially migrate. They are in natural objects. Just to to compare, 
Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Just to compare, in all conditions radioactive waste in Ukraine, we have 6,000 curies, and there was a very considerable leakage of strontium 90 from Fukushima liquid radioactive waste storage tank, and it was 1,300 curies. When compared to this one, though it was very con considerable, considerable accident, but when compared to this one, it looks like. Um, then let's imagine that all these thousands of curies decided to disappear from to go from the territory of the exclusion zone. Then 90 percent, up to 95 percent, will go with the river, River Pripyat, into the river of Dnieper. Dnieper River goes throughout Ukraine and will distribute all the thousands of curies to uh, in Ukraine from north to the south. Then around 10 percent will go with the air. Three for up to three percent with biogenic uh, through the biogenic uh, way, and technogenic migration is will be responsible for less than one percent of of the linkage. This is because we have a very good system for radiation control at the outset of the radi uh, of the contaminated area. But please remember that we have put two already two barriers around the reactor four. Because of that, the, the radioactivity that leaks from the radi uh, from Chernobyl nuclear power plant unit four is smaller, 150 times, uh, 125 times less than radi radioactivity transported by personnel outside the zone. 500 times less than radioactivity transported by animals outside the zone because we cannot control the animals. And 300 times less than radioactivity transported by the river prefects every year. Remember, please, that we can put the barriers, artificial barriers, on Chernobyl Unit 4. If needed, but God saves from that, we will put number three, barrier number three, and we will put bigger and bigger and bigger. But you cannot put the barrier to the strontium, for example, which migrates into the deep of the soil. You cannot put the barrier to the cesium, which is present as the airborne contamination. So please remember that on the territory of exclusion zone, the most dangerous thing is not the uniform. It's the territory itself, which is very dangerous. And with regard to the radionuclide dispersed in the environment, the exclusion zone is a protective barrier itself. The bigger the zone, the bigger the territory is restricted, the more protective uh, properties it possesses. And its protective function or barrier function of Chernobyl exclusion zone is realized through natural objects, artificial objects, and artificial pro process of the basic things. Let's go down to the ta uh, town of Chernobyl, just to brief information because there is always some misunderstanding about that. If, I'm not, if my pronunciation is correct, that this word is pronounced as Yomogi, right? So this is actually what Chernobyl means in Japanese. So Chernobyl is Yomogi. So it's a plant, it's a of a plant, which is a very bad weed. It's hard to remove from the, 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 fall, the farm fields. It has very, very bitter taste, and it is extremely to toxic. So if you ever in your life happen to give a name to a nuclear power plant, please keep in mind them that words sometimes can become true. So this is what Chernobyl Station Zone looks for, from space. And I would like to pay attention to the fact that their reactor for is not is far from Chernobyl comparatively far. There is the distance is around 17 kilometers or so, 15 to 17. But it's very close to the town of Pripyat, and Pripyat is absolutely dead. No one lives there. Chernobyl is inhabited, more or less. We, we, we're going to talk about it anyway. It's an, admi an administrative zone of Chernobyl exclusion zone, which is has the boundaries of this. Uh, this is what Chernobyl looks from, from like the birth seat. And generally, it's lo it looks like um, an ordinary town, slightly overtaken by the wood already. Um, we have here our laboratory, and this is the, the district of the town where the personnel resides when in shift. And also, what I found, this is where the regard to remember that question mark about the population that was evacuated. This is the Kajabi note, founded uh, of the, it was issued around 
I believe 18 months after the accident, it, they report that people are returning back to Chernobyl. It's still very highly radioactive territory, very much contaminated, but over 1,000 people have returned. They started returning immediately, and the reasons for that are the following. First of all, they cannot accept the new lifestyle. Imagine that you are 60 years old, you've grown up in a private house with your garden, and now you're, mm, you've been moved to a very big city and put on a small apartment on, in the ninth floor. You will not be definitely happy. You cannot live like that. The old babushkas, as we call them, who've never seen the elevator, for example, they cannot live in big cities. They are concerned about their property. This is the basic uh, difference between our exclusion zone and your exclusion zone. As far as I know, everything stays untouched in Fukushima exclusion zone, right? Our exclusion zone was robbed heavily after that. Then they simply didn't understand what, what radioactivity, radioactivity was and the uh, consequences of exposure of radiation, what they were. Actually, I would say that not many people in that time understood what the radioactivity was, in, including the scientists. And uh, they simply saw that if we don't have fever, if we don't feel itchy, if we don't have burns, why should we remove what radioactivity I'm talking about? We didn't feel it, so we don't believe it was like imagine, imagination of the government who wanted to go back. And there was simply lack of regulation. There wasn't a law which would say that Living here is prohibited. You cannot return. That's why, finally, on uh, in 1991, the issue was uh, the law was issued, which was called on the status of the territories affected by the Chernobyl accident, which stated that residence in Chernobyl exclusion zone is considered illegal, and if you do stay in Chernobyl for like for living, then you commit crime. Since that, the population or so the self-settlers or returnees, they don't like the word self-settlers. They say, we don't like self-settlers. It's our houses where returnees were returned to home. Started like declining in, in very severely after that. And for today, we have around not more than 170 people or something. All of them are very elderly people. Um, they on average they are 60. They're not very healthy, and the vast majority of them are women because women live longer usually. And uh, they are not forced out of the territory, obviously. And this girl is very remarkable. His name is Maria Savenko, and she was the only child who was born in Chernobyl after the accident. And now she's 80, and she lived, lives outside the Chernobyl. So about the activities. We conduct a range of activities in Chernobyl, not only us, but all the 6,000 of personnel. Uh, the main activity is radiation protection. Also, we do radioactive waste management, the commissioning of Chernobyl nuclear power plant, water conservation, etc., etc. But the most remarkable thing is that all these activities are dependent on each other in some way, but all of them uh, are a part of radiation protection and are connected with radiation protection, which is more. Uh, no activity can be conducted in Chernobyl exclusion zone if it doesn't uh, coincide with the aims of the radiation protection. In other words, if you do something that contradicts the ideas of radiation protection, you cannot carry this activity out in Chernobyl exclusion zone. So I'm more or less clear with what to monitor. So let's go to the next how to monitor them. So what is a radiation environmental monitoring? This is data collecting or simply measurements, then processing, calculations, data transfer to the department or the department who uh, do the long-term storage and analysis of data. They make prognosing, then they elaborate recommendations for managerial decision making. Some basic things about mo radiation monitoring in Chernobyl exclusion zone. First of all, this is an important part of the national system of environmental monitoring. We don't do it just for ourselves, just to know how the things are going. Actually, this is a task which was given us by government. Secondary, it's obligatory under any circumstances. If the monitoring is not conducted, then there is no excuse to the person who is responsible to that. 
uh, which is more, if there were some activities and Chernobyl decisions of, and there is no monitoring, this is considered as a crime. And there, the person will be charged with the uh, criminal responsibility. Uh, radiation environmental monitoring is based on prioritizing. Basically, it means that it's very flexible. So if we have, for example, a wildfire in Chernobyl station zone, we will put all our effort to monitoring air pollution. We will not monitor the underground water somewhere on the other, other end of uh, the Chernobyl station zone, but we will put more effort into monitoring of the uh, processes or activities or um, objects that can contribute to worsening of the radiation situation in Chernobyl station zone. It should be performed by an independent organization, which means an interested organization, like state specialized enterprise Eco Center. It's called specialized because it was specially designed for monitoring of exclusion zone. We are not interested in the result. We just elaborate the data. We do not produce radioactive waste. We are not interested to hide some information that we did some harm to cause some harm to the environment. We just give data. We show how everything is going in reality. Now it is about establishing the system, how it evolved. Actually, the monitoring more or less started immediately after the, the accident. It was just an evaluation of composition and scale of radioactive contamination because it happened unexpectedly. Of course, we didn't plan Chernobyl and we just didn't know what what it looks like, but there wasn't really need for monitoring as we have it today because here is um, background from the 1996, the first days after after the the accident. Here's the 30th of uh, April and the 1st of May, and you see that the, the background in Kiev. It's not in Chernobyl. It's in Kiev, which is 150 kilometers away from Chernobyl. The gamma uh, background reaches like 25, 28 microsievert per hour in the center of Kyiv. Today we have in Chernobyl, not in Chernobyl zone, but in the town of Chernobyl, which is on the territory of Chernobyl zone, near our enterprise, we have 0.3 on average, and that's a lot. Normally in the city you have 0 0.10, 0 0.12. That was 25. That was a lot due to the wind. So we, there was need to go there and pick up some samples and trace the right hand flight, obviously. Uh, then, from the next year, 1996 to 1991, they performed some evaluation of structure of radioactive contamination. I believe that there were a lot of scientists from many, many other countries, and what they did was actually a radio ge geochemical investigation. They investigated how the radionuclides migrate in that um, or this type of the rock or soil, etc. And with this data, they were able to develop a scheduled monitoring system. We will study about the schedule for monitoring later. But the schedule, it means that some regular measurements in, in definite points of definite places uh, of the exclusion zone. And this monitoring system was operated until 1998, uh, 2008, sorry. 2008, and after that, we, we just realized that as any other territory, the territory of the exclusion zone is changing, and we need to adjust the monitoring system to the current needs, to, it, to the changes, and since then, we consider the need for upgrade of the system, and we do introduce small improvements every year and even every day. So I will already mention the monitoring schedules. What is it? What is it? It's a very, very important document, which is approved by the State Agency of Exclusions and Management. We also have to get a signature and a stamp from the Ministry of Health. This determines how the objects, uh, the objects that are covered under uh, radiation environmental monitoring, where we take samples or where we do field measurements. The scope and frequency of radiation environment monitoring, times of measurements and parameters and sampling and measurement methodologies. What is also important that this is not like document forever. It's usually revised every five years and last time we have it revised was the end of, 19, of 2016. So since the first January we have the new monitoring 
a schedule and uh, actually Satrap's project was the project that contributed that was very much handy at the time because we introduced really important amendments to this monitoring schedule. So here is the small table, no, small, but a table from the monetary schedule that shows actually what we monitor. Here are the list of objects. We also saw that industrial sites like disposal facilities, Chernobyl, prepared landscapes, soil vegetation, uh, water bodies, near surface layer, flowers, etc., etc. We do some number of samples per year, and what we measure is the zero one to seven, which is basically gamma, strontium ninety, uh, plutoniums, and emulsion. This is what we are paid for by the government. So it was considered that this is enough to describe the situation and to, to trace how the uh, contamination evolves. Uh, so totally we take around 4,000 samples per year and we do around 10,000 measurements and we also have 5% mar margin in case of accidents. Um, accidents got saves from the accident at Chernobyl and nuclear power plant again or some something Hopefully, we will not have anything, any issues with the with the shelter object, etc. But for example, in the case of the wildfires, then we need definitely to do more measurement. Then we have five percent. This is this number. Is this figure is very important because this is fully paid for by the government. If you want to do some other measurements, we have to do them for our own cost. I would like to draw your attention to this part of the table, which shows self setters. See, we monitor their foodstuff, drinking water, backyards, and so on, and we totally government pays for 300 measurements per year. There is a little di discrepancy between the law of 1991 and this schedule. On one hand, they are criminals. They consider cr they commit crime when when leaving, staying for residence in exclusion zone. On the other hand, the, the Constitution guarantees that any person can choose the residence, play for residence, whenever they want, wherever they want. So this shows that government said, yes, okay, they committed crime, but they want to live there, and their safety is our priority. Let them be at least sure about what they are eating and drinking, like that. Which shows that government in this respect feels responsible for them. And here is the, uh, the pie chart that shows how the measurements are allocated between different types of uh, samples for uh, different types of media for radiation monitoring, from which you see that about one third is soils, which is tricky because it's very sample preparation for the chemistry is not very good. And this one you have in your uh, handouts, I guess. So it shows how actually the monitor, it demonstrates the flexibility of monetary. This one, it, uh, this uh, scheme shows that there are two modes basically for monitoring, and this one refers to the wildfires, for example. We have a set of objects that are to be monitored normally. When they have normal operation, then there is an automatic system for addition control that gives out the, uh, the gamma dose rate every hour. Automatically, every, every, all the data goes to the eco center and we see the dose rate. Uh, weekly, every week, we take the surface water from the river. From we have actually two rivers. We have uh, lakes. We have ponds. We collect the water and we do analysis. And every uh, five days, we replace the filters. A uh, filter so that's taking the yeah, samples of new surface atmospheric uh, layer. So let's imagine we have a wildfire. Then the, the emergency is announced and the director general says we have an emergency. Immediately the system turns, switches to uh, uh, emergency mode. So the automated system starts reporting every two minutes, every two days we take uh, samples of surface water and every six hours the team goes and replaces the filters. So that's why the system works like this. Uh, the next two slides are just to illustrate the capacity. You see that the surface water, we take the groundwater, soil, 
enormous no amount of sampling, all types of samples, and here the map showing how our uh, how our sampling points are allocated around the Chernobyl zone. Here is Chernobyl. Here is the uh, industrial site or Chernobyl nuclear power plant and object shelter and you see that uh, the density of sampling points and control uh, gamma tracers that report the, the dose rate are really, really, this concentration of monitoring points is really, really uh, high here because we are based on prioritizing the priority. We know that this is dangerous place. Also, we have a range of the uh, boreholes around the cooling pond. This is the cooling pond. Also, we have some uh, this aspiration, aspiration facilities, aspirating facilities where we take samples of air and many other stuff. And you see that practically we embrace the whole territory of monitoring. The, the amount of work, and you have not only monitor that, but you have to make sure we have you have to do maintenance of all the stuff, of all the automatic gamma tracers, of all the places of monitoring. You have to cut the grass. You have to make sure that animals didn't break anything, and if they did, you have to repair. And after the storm, you also have to go and repair. And regardless of of the weather, you have to go and do the maintenance because the data should be given on time. And the amount of work is tremendous, but believe me, once you establish a sound, a good monitoring system, it starts working by itself. I don't interfere into the monitoring. It goes as a background, as a laboratory. The samples come, each on their time. Everyone knows what to do. Everyone knows what he's responsible for. What I plan is actually only characterization. And once it was established, you only need slight uh, corrections, not like severe intrusion into that and severe corruption. So, let us consider monitoring as a sum of components like ongoing measurements, sampling field measurements, laboratory measurements, and data analysis and reporting. Ongoing measurements are represented by two systems, automatic system for radiation control and system for non-proliferation control. Automatic system for radiation control is a system that consists of uh, 32 of 39 uh, automated uh, gamma tracers that report the actually the dose rate. They are concentrated heavily around the the Chernobyl industrial site because it's the most dangerous places, and they also are r around the territories. And uh, it can switch to different modes like normal and uh, emergency. You already know that. And system for non-proliferation control. You basically know what it is. Non-proliferation, yeah. So we, w I already told you that, or maybe I have not mentioned that uh, Chernobyl exclusion zone is the, the territory of res which is restricted. It's not enough just to show your passport and go in. You have to get a permit well in advance there. And if you leave the territory, uh, you, there are three places basically where you can leave the territory from. There are special monitors that monitor the activity or the dose rate that you try to carry out of the zone and if something happens, if they want to see that you're carrying something suspicious with you, then we'll, we'll know that immediately at the center, wherever it happens. So it works like this. Here are the three uh, checkpoints through which you can go out of the zone. In case something happens, we will know immediately about that. There is no chance to go. Uh, okay, I need to, to show some videos again. Will it be a problem? Videos? Ah, thank you. So here's something. Okay. Here's the way that we sample the the air samples or the filters. It was video with, that was uh, made especially for you just several weeks ago. So here is the aspiration plant. To reflect. This is a basically a compressor that sucks the air in through the filter, that pumps the air through the filter. Here is the person who has come to take to do the measurements. They control if there were if everything was okay with the electricity because if it was stopped, then we have to correct the amount of uh, cubic meters of uh, air that has come through. So it makes he makes the note that everything was okay. Here's the controller. They check the, the amount of cubic meters that's what comes through the aspiration pump. Now they stop it. And they will go and check the filter outside. 
The filter is outside. Now one. They open very slowly. But I said that I need like one hour for that, for the presentation. So, see the filter. See, it's, it's very dirty. But the filter is replaced every five days. Why is it that so black? Who can guess? So, this is winter, it's very cold, and people in the nearest villages, they used to, they don't have heating normally, and they used fire, fire they used woods, uh, to trees, to, to, to heat, to organize the heating at home, that's why this goes with the smoke, with the fumes. Although this, these are not people who basically who live in Chernobyl, but the people who, from the outside. So it gets contaminated, it goes inside, because the, this cabin is built to, just to protect the equipment, the electrical equipment, from, from animals, from storms. It's taking the filter. Just put it there in the bag. And now he will be doing a big work uh, for uh, replacing the filter. The filter is made of Petronov's clothes. Maybe you have seen Petronov's clothes. Petronov. Petronov's clothes. It's a special type of clothes that is used for the filter. It's very sticky. It can it has several layers and if you just attach it like for example for a cloth that it will leave the the it's very sticky and it grabs every solid particle that goes through it. Petronov's clothes. tries to put it to attach it to the ring. By the way, we got this uh, Petronov's clothes in big pieces and they have sewing machine. This big guys to the filter themselves. It's very funny to see them doing that. And finally, yes, he manages to do that. What he will do the next? He will be calibrating the other, will measure the pressure on the output of the, the trading facility. Putting me back. They make sure that it's okay, that it's correctly there. They're measuring the pressure at the, at the output, and with this pressure, they're gonna calibrate the the system again so that they they give the data on the pressure and it calculates the the speed of pumping, the the rate, the uh, the flow rate of the air. So then I'm gonna put and wait. Sorry. Calibration. Yeah, calibration. Exactly. Okay. So it's clear, basically. And the system will calibrate itself. So it will just wait for some time and then restart it. I think that this is all about it. Then the groundwater level measurement. Oh, it's okay this time, you see. So this is the the borehole. They put the special tape there and measure the level of the water. It's very important to know because this is this is called the field measurements actually. Now he knows the depths. I don't know actually the depth, but I'm not interested in that. This is like four meters, maybe like that. They control if the level drops or 
or rises because it influences if we take samples from this borehole or not. Basically, that's all. And groundwater sampling. They use the, the pump for that. Uh, basically, in this video, there are going to be two ways of sampling shown, which are carried out in parallel. Uh, so the one is with the pump, so they, the lab will, they take the sample of the water horizon and it's in this case. And uh, the other pe and other people are, say this is the bathymeter that they put inside of the, the, uh, the, um, the tube, the pump, uh, the, the tube which is, they're going to take the sample of what is in the tube, of water that is in the tube in the borehole, not in the horizon, but in the borehole. Looks very awkward, but they need to pump the, the uh, borehole through to make sure that they take sample not from that part of the pipe, but from the water horizon. They know how much time they need to, to spend waiting. It was like minus 10, I guess, or something. <laughs> but regardless of the weather, even if it's raining heavily, they have to do it today. So, I love my job. I have to say it at the, the room. I just <laughs> and here's the bathing meter. So basically, that's it. So, thank you. Okay, sample preparation. Though it was not included here because uh, into like the part of monitoring, but sample preparation as well as for waste characterization is very, very important. Sample preparation actually changes the environmental object tremendously. For example, groundwater comes like this, like 40, 10, 20, 40, can 40 liter canisters, and what goes to the uh, measurement looks like this. Vegetation comes like a needle, comes like needles from the uh, pine tree or as a bark or as a timber, it doesn't matter. But what goes to the measurement looks like this. Water biocenosis comes as, I would say, not a very uh, famous catfish, you know, the catfish, yes, we sometimes get them. But what, what goes to the measurement looks like this the ash. Looks like the ash. So we separate bones from, from muscles and the intestines also and everything looks like ash when it goes to, to measurement. And actually measurements are performed at the laboratory, at the same laboratory who does the, sample, uh, the characterization of radioactive waste, but it's, everything goes in a very, I would say, background mode. So it goes by itself. I do not control the, the monitoring samples. When they come, everyone already knows what to do. Basically, what we do now is sample preparation, gamma spectrometry, or radiochemistry, or another radiochemistry for alpha beta spectrometry. Normally, we measure gamma emitters, strontium, plutonium, and emerytium. Thanks to Citrips from this year, we decided also to add chemistry. Chemistry of water. We took only the river prepet and uh, the river prepet, and basically, two points and 12, sam uh, 12 samples from each point per year, which means like 24 samples per year. We're gonna measure these parameters and after the first year we're gonna see if some information can be derived from this parameter because no one has ever done hydrochemical monitoring in Chernobyl. And after five years, I guess maybe even uh, earlier, we want to introduce also chemical monitoring for solid. But we need to make sure that we will be able to use this information, otherwise the government will not pay for that, obviously. So data analysis. Unlike in characterization, we don't process data. The laboratory doesn't process data. We only do measurements, we, take, we get the sample, we prepare it, we do the measurements, and we go to the data to the department for, in, in, uh, for information and science and say seven. And they say, okay, we now tackle this figure. Basically, we don't check the figures. We don't uh, 
lead the statistics. We don't process the data. It's them. So they provide, this department provide online monitoring, modeling, prognosing, decision making, information for decision making, and also this data is used for raising public awareness about what's going on in Chernobyl exclusion zone. Basically the model of everything looks like this. We produce data, the laboratory produces the figure of the Tunberg world. That's all. Then this, this data goes to the Department of Information of Science where they say, okay, Ten Beckerel, thank you very much. I'm going to put it on the database. They are the users of the database. We don't use this space. And they say, hmm, this is more than it was like mom. So they produce information. Then we discuss this data at our scientific councils and we produce knowledge, which is data that can be applied for some decision. And when this information goes to the uh, state exclusion uh, management, uh, state agency on the management on the, of exclusion zone, then they do managerial decisions actually. It's they who decide what to do, and this is basically wisdom. We hope that it's wisdom. So, why to monitor? The only aim of monitoring, the main aim, is to develop knowledge, applicable and practical knowledge. This is why to monitor. When you get down, this is not. It's not the reason to want to. But when you know if it was more or how the changes go or or just you know how to apply this information, this is what to monitor. So which kind of knowledge can be created with the help of monitoring? First of all, we uh, develop and create data for radiation mapping, which is very important. I'm going to show you the three um, uh, the three uh, most important maps that were created with the help of uh, radiation monitoring data. This is the contamination of Chernobyl exclusion zone by cesium-137, contamination by plutonium isotopes, and also the prognosis uh, for contamination of americium in 1956. Why is it important? You know that the mother uh, isotope for americium is plutonium, in 241 and uh, emerytium is kind of accumulated and it will reach its maximum activity in, in the year 2056 that it and its concentration, activity concentration in the exclusion, Chernobyl exclusion zone will look like this. Secondly, what we do is we assess the radioactive contamination. Here is the balance of radioactivity that we created in various objects of Chernobyl exclusion zone. You see that the shelter contains enormous amount of activity, but the territory of exclusion zone contains also very considerable amount of radioactivity, for example, uh, more than in temporary storage facilities. This is just the territory on the territory in the soil in different objects, environmental objects of Chernobyl exclusion zone. This data is widely used by other organizations, for example. Also, we do the monitoring of the products that are cons consumed by people who decided to stay or to return to the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And I would say that the results are, dis I would say that they don't make us really happy. Here is the permissible activity of Friday and Clark in, in products according to our sanitary standards. This is the times that, that it exceeds the, the norm. For example, if in fruit, if let's say fresh mushrooms, if the maximum permissible activity is 500 becquerel per kilo, then them had 500,000 becquerel per kilo, because they, which is actually the means that they eat the radioactive waste, because they gather the mushrooms in the on the territory of Chernobyl Station Zone. The same, every product. There is no product which is within the limits permissible activity. What they eat is highly radioactive. Also we do risk assessment and safety assurance. This table this, uh, may seem a bit tricky but actually we did a, a big job a big job trying to uh, evaluate uh, index of radiation hazard of a set of activities or events and to show how dangerous they are. This is very tricky and this is very interesting because we can assess the, the hazard of the event. For example, take 
uh, radiation accident at uh, nuclear safe confinement, for example. Nuclear safe, uh, new, new, not nuclear, new safe confinement, which actually the Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant unit for covered by this new arc. Um, if something happens and it falls down, actually this can happen one in 100, once in 100 years, as we well. said. It will have the index of radiation hazard of two, but the index of radiation hazard of every day work of the personnel is 25. So it's more hazardous, more than 10 times hazardous to work in the Chernobyl exclusion zone than this radiation accident. The most hazardous event is water transportation or flood. This usually happens every four years on average. So the hazard will be 62. Uh, there was also a very interesting work that we performed uh, with a cooperation with the OSC, the demarcation of the ukraine belarus state border. Uh, you see here is the map, here is the part of Ukraine, and here is Belarus, and here is Russia, and the part of the border between Belarus and Ukraine goes through the uh, Chernobyl exclusion zone through the very, very contaminated area. And they needed to put the signs there to like to make it look like a state border, not like a wood. And for that, they needed to assess the safety, to do the safety assessment, and to elaborate instructions. Actually, oh, what happened? <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> So uh, actually, uh, the people who were supposed to do this work, they were not specialists in uh, radiation safety. They were just a special brigade who would do this. And the terrain was very tricky, like thick wood, like streams, rivers, and marshland. And they just needed to know, if I go from point one from to point two, what, how I need to protect myself? If I go from point two to point three, what I need to do? If I decide to cut the woods, where, what I have to do with the woods then? Some, something is going on. Maybe there is. Okay. Let it be. So, okay. We did a very extensive job. We measured actually the radioactivity, the dose rate, and all the measurements uh, up to the depth, uh, the concentration of radioactive red light up to the depth they want to, to, to install this uh, science. We measured, measured the amount of activity they're going to dig out, and told them how to behave. Of course, we developed a range of instructions that look very serious, but also for those who will, who will do it, we developed the pictures, because I will see if you have ever dealt with them, they lack pictures very much. So we showed that during uh, on the way of this 150 kilometers, if they move along the green line, they will need to use only dosimeters. If they move along the yellow line, they will need dosimeter plus extra uh, protection equipment. Also, we showed them that they are they are not allowed to take the protective equipment outside. Cannot eat, cannot drink, not make fire. Got saves from that. We have enough of our own. They cannot shoot the animals if they see, if they want, even if they are very hungry and they cannot sunbathe, if they have free time. And if they find the orphan source, it happens, you know, that uh, that there were 1,000 uh, temporary storage facilities. But if, in fact, they dig and start digging and find the orphan sources, then they have to call to remove themselves from there and if someone suffers they need to do the, the first aid and if there is a wildfire they need also to call or to get to um, call to the eco center to put on protective equipment and run away according to the specific route. Also we obtain with our system of monitoring we are capable of obtaining information about nuclear incidents. There is a Fukushima accident there was in March of 2000 uh, 11 and it happened to run here on the 11th I guess right if I'm not mistaken so it was somewhere here and after two weeks it everything came to Ukraine 
and we were ab uh, able to detect it, of course, because we saw the uh, radionuclides, which are not typical for the exclusion zone anymore, but they're typical for other nuclei after that. But it would have been very, very strange if we never noticed that, because it was a very considerable event. But also, once, it was recently, we detected, my head of the department for spectrometry detected, uh, reported to me that iodine 131 was detected in the near surface atmospheric layer. We checked it and we checked and we checked, but it still was there. And on the 25th of October, the Region Institute for Energy Technology reported that a small leakage of radioactivity from Halden Research Reactor occurred. Actually, I don't know if it was very small, but a range of institutions captured this iodine. Uh, green ones mean that they captured actually iodine, but it was below their detection limit, but we were capable of uh, making the estimation about the activity of the creation, and this Halden research reactor is somewhere over here. So, if someone has problems around us with radioactivity, we'll definitely know it, because actually our monitoring system doesn't choose, these are from Chernobyl, and I measure them, these are come from Norway, I will not measure them. So conclusion, Chernobyl, exclusion zone, after 30 years of the accident, is still an open area source of radiation. And the workers who are in Chernobyl exclusion zone are still exposed to potential radiation risk, which is very high. Environmental radiation monitoring is a very complicated system. It involves considerable amount of resources, of money, of effort, of people. But believe me, if you do everything correct from the very beginning, it doesn't require a lot of introduce, intro, intervention with it. Just slightly correction from time to time. Environmental radiation monitoring is a vital part of radiation safety, not only for exclusion zone, but for, but for the whole country. Because in case of something, we will be the first who will determine the, the hazard. And observing the trends in Chernobyl uh, radionuclides is only one of the many tasks of environmental radiation monitoring. We develop knowledge and many, many people all around the world use our knowledge. Thank you. Do you have any questions?